Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a situation where the district court kind of hijacked a case dealing with cop misconduct and prevented the plaintiff from effectively being heard. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is confused, and so am I. This is the case of John L. Allen et al. versus the city of Houston. In this case, a police officer did something which was perhaps bad. The government was prepared to provide the video, audio, documentation, all that stuff to the plaintiff so they you could have it for the purposes of the lawsuit. And then the court just seized all that stuff and then rendered a decision without giving it to the other party for some reason. Very weird. But this is the case that we're going to read about and try to figure out what the heck happened here procedurally. Let's get started with this. On the 4th of November, 2015, decedent, he's dead, John Allen Sr. was driving in Houston, Texas, when Houston police officers Justin Hayes and Tyler Salina stopped his vehicle for traffic violations. Charnell Atterbury was riding in Allen's front seat. Officer Salina approached the driver's side window, which did not function. On the other hand, the passenger side window that Officer Hayes approached was rolled down fully. Officer Hayes did not identify himself, ask for Allen's name, or state the reason for the stop. When Allen attempted to provide his identification from his wall to Officer Hayes, the officer became agitated and instructed him to stop moving and get his foot off the gas. Officer Hayes subsequently commanded Allen to stop reaching and get his hands out of his pocket. When Mr. Allen complied with these commands, Officer Hayes shot, fired six shots, five of which struck Allen. Despite Arterbury's pleading with Officer Hayes not to shoot, the entire counter lasted 23 seconds. Okay, so a whole lot of stuff just happened in these 23 seconds. We got a police officer pulling over a car for a bunch of traffic violations. They're coming over to the window. The driver's side window isn't working, but the passenger side is. And apparently this, the officers didn't identify himself. And also apparently the driver is reaching for something, which we now know to be his wallet, and then shots are fired. So this is not great in terms of the interaction with this. Here is my recommendation to help try to avoid some of these problems. First of all, you probably want to try to make sure that your window works so that depending on what off side the officer comes to, you don't have to deal with this problem. So that would be ideal. F second thing, put on an interior light, put your car in park, and put your hands on the wheel and don't move them until the officer asks you to because the officer doesn't know what you're reaching for. And the, I've seen enough videos on YouTube to see traffic interactions go from zero to 60 real quick, real quick. So you want to make sure that you're not doing this to avoid some of these problems. Now, this won't present all these problems. It doesn't necessarily mean the officers acted properly here or not. I'm not speaking to this. I'm just trying to give some pro tips to people to try to make sure that they can do what they can to prevent these issues from doing. And when the officer says, can I get your wallet? You say, I'm moving. I'm going to now reach into my pocket to get my wallet. I'm now going to reach into the glove compartment to get whatever. So describe what you're doing as you're doing it. These are some tips that... I follow personally too when I'm stopped over. I do these things. I'm telling you things I do from my own experience. I put my car in park. I've been pulled over a couple times, not a lot, but I've been pulled over a couple times. Every time I put my car in park, I turn on the interior light, I roll down the windows, I put my hands on the window and I, I'm on my driver's wheel and I wait. And I don't do anything until I'm asked to do to make sure that we're all clear. So I'm not telling you anything I wouldn't do. These are some recommendations. Let's press on with the case and figure out what's going on. Officer Hayes told a police investigator that Allen tried to pull a gun out of his right pocket and Officer Hayes was able to see that it was white handled. Officer Hayes also stated to a police investigator that the last time he saw the firearm was while Allen tried to pull it out of his right pocket. Police, however, did not locate a firearm on his person or in the vehicle, but they did find a wallet. While in overnight in police custody, Atterbury said she saw a gun, but quickly recanted once she re once released and stated Allen neither had a firearm nor pulled one on Officer Hayes. So I am partially sympathetic to the police's position here because I've seen enough roadside video to see enough interactions go from zero to 60 to understand that the police sometimes have to make these split second decisions on life or death. This is the kind of thing that QI was invented for, this kind of situation. We've seen QI abused and pushed beyond recognition and used in all kinds of circumstances where they have plenty of time to think plenty of time to reason and still made decisions that forfeit people's constitutional rights. But here I understand why the police acted the way they did. 
the person reaches for something, they don't know what it is, they see something coming out, the furtive gesture it's sometimes called, and the police have to make a decision. Did they make the right decision? Should they made a different decision? Was this a just shooting? Was it an unjust shooting? I'm not speaking to any of those ultimate conclusions. I'm just simply saying that I understand the reasons that this would have happened, and that's why I gave the advice I did earlier, to try to reduce the situation down so that everyone is acting more calmly and no one has to make impulsive decisions. Because we all want to go home at the end of the day, the police officer and the suspect. So let's do the things we can to promote that. The plaintiffs filed this action in Texas State Court on the 3rd of November 2017 against the officers, claiming they used excess force and filed a violation of 1983. So your run-of-the-mill 1983 case, we cover these all the times. Where it went off the rails is the procedure. So let's read a little bit about that. As provided for in a transcript of the 14th of September 2018 scheduling conference at which the district judge provided, defendants produced a compact CD containing the required initial disclosures, such as the body camera videos, everything from the incident, and the internal affairs files. So the prosecutor, the, the parties are in court, and they have a CD that they're going to hand deliver in court to the party for part of discovery. That was the plan. We have all this. We have all the information. We're going to hand them the CD. Great. Obviously, defendants intended to produce the CD to the plaintiffs. We're in the same place. We're going to hand it to them. The district judge, however, instructed defendants to give him the CD instead and ordered the plaintiffs to respond to a motion to dismiss. So that's really, really weird and really weird and, and not what should have happened. So the, the, the parties are in court for whatever they happen to be in court for, and they have to produce discovery. It's not uncommon to produce discovery by messenger. It's also not uncommon to, dis to, to provide discovery in person. If you happen to be in person at the same time, why not? So they came with everything on a CD. It's like, I have the CD. I have all your discovery. I'm going to give it to you right now. Also has the side bonus of showing that you're producing discovery to the judge, which can be helpful to show that you're acting in good faith. So that's a nice little bonus too. So I have the CD. It has the body cam footage. It has the reports, internal investigation, has everything you need. And the trial judge says, what is that? Oh, it says, oh, it's the, it's the discovery. I'm going to give it to the other side. And the judge says, hand me the discovery. Wait, what? And then he says to the other side, prepare a motion to dismiss response. But I don't have the discovery. You just took it from me. I am supposed to have the discovery. Why are you having the discovery? Disco what is this? What are you doing? Why am I preparing a motion to dismiss? So the trial judge basically hacked, hijacked the proceedings. The party was ready to proceed with discovery, and the trial judge said, nope, I'll take that and also prepare a motion to dismiss. What? What's happening? I don't know. The defendants had moved on the 29th of January for a protective order to prevent the plan from publicly disclosing specific files maintained pursuant to the local government code. A police department may maintain personnel file on police officer employed by department for department use, but may not release any information contained in the file to any other person or agency requesting the information relating to an officer. Perfectly fine and perfectly normal. Sometimes things are for the party's eyes only, sometimes even for attorney's eyes only. So we're going to give you something as discovery because you're entitled to it as part of your lawsuit. But this information is secret. This is information that we are not required to disclose. This is an open records request. So not unusual. We have put in this order on the 29th of January for a protective order, contemplating, contemplating presumably our discovery. So as we want to move to the judge. It's like we want a protective order. It says we want certain things. We want you to make sure that they don't disclose certain things. Nothing unusual about this. It happens not infrequently. It happens with trade secrets. It happens with company secrets. It happens with financial information. It happens with personal identifiable data. It happens with medical records. It happens with all kinds of records that are needed for litigation, but not necessarily for open disclosure. So we want a protective record. Will you give us this? Apparently, just seize the records. That's not exactly what we were asking for, but okay, way to go above the distance, I suppose. Subsequent to the scheduling conference, the defendants provide two non-functional CDs to the plaintiffs. So after they seized the CD, the defendants are still trying to produce the discovery that they had originally. And they produced two non-functional CDs to the plaintiffs. Presumably someone forgot to end their session in whatever CD burner tool they were using. After the plaintiffs notified they had not received the functional CDs, 
the court's 22nd February 1 sentence order required the city to give the plaintiff a disc that works. I, I don't know necessarily why you were notifying the court, but as opposed to the other party, maybe they're being a bit of a jerk, but it said, okay, give them a disc that works. Therefore, on the 23rd of January, February, and stated in the motion to extend time for reply, they provide a voluminous information on the CD. So they provided a whole bunch of stuff on the CD, more than you asked for, drowning in paperwork, not untypical. As stated in these plaintiff's 13 September post-judgment motions, these included key additional facts from witness statements, photographs, investigation reports, and dispatch call information. Lots of stuff. We're finally getting it. We're getting a little bit later than we anticipated after the court hijacked our initial discovery for some reason, but okay, we've, we finally got that. That's good news. On the 16th of August, 2018, the court's opinion of dismissal noted, the amended complaint describes the body camera video and the court considered them in the decision. What? This reference to them is presumably not only to the descriptions of the video in the amended complaint, but instead to the video cameras footage to the district cameras, thus converting the motion to dismiss into a rule for summary judgment. Okay, no, no, that's 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 not how this works procedurally. You have to give the other side a fair opportunity. And you it's a little bit early, particularly since no one has moved for summary judgment. It's a little early. So the the trial court said, oh, I've considered them in my decision. Wait, what is that? What is happening now? You've considered them. What do you mean you've considered them? They're not even part of the record yet because all we were in was in discovery. Now you hijacked them, but they're not in the record. You, How can you consider them? They're not there. And we haven't had any opportunity for us both to describe the video and its significance and what it does or does not show and the legal significance thereof nor have we had any opportunity to consider to submit other stuff that might be relevant. For example, the dispatch calls or the internal investigation reports or whatever else is in this thing. We haven't had the opportunity to submit that as evidence. And you want to give a, a summary judgment out of nowhere on, based on the body camera footage when we haven't, we haven't really seen it. We haven't had a chance to describe it. What is going on here? You, you've hijacked our case. Why, why, why have you hijacked our case, trial judge? And now you're rendering a decision that this is going to be dismissed on summary judgment because it's over. What? This, this isn't how this goes procedurally. This isn't, this isn't what due process looks like, in case you're curious. There's a reason we have these processes in place. They're time-tested and well-worn. This is none of those things. On appeal, because we're on appeal, because we had a summary judgment, because the trial court dismissed our claim for some reason, but that's where we are. We're on, we're on appeal. Here's our appeal. Um, the trial court just completely screwed this. The plaintiffs do not contest the denial of the post-judgment motion, nor do they contest Officer Salinas being dismissed for failure to serve process. So there's some things here the trial court got right. So Officer Selena was dismissed from the complaint because we never actually served her. Bad attorney. But there are some other things going on. For reasons that remain unclear, <laughs> for reasons that remain unclear, the record on appeal does not contain any CD. How about it was never on the record because it was never submitted as evidence because the trial judge just kind of hacked it, jacked, jacked it. It does not contain any CD, including the body camera videos and the documents, including the CD, which the district judge took at the hearing. In that regard, following extensive questioning of both sides at oral argument before our court about the missing CD not being included on the record on appeal, the parties file a joint motion to supplement the record on appeal with the entire disclosures of all the videos submitted at the court. So yeah, that's 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 hilarious. The initial the initial hearing is what videos, what records? They're not here because of course they weren't because they're not part of the record. They were never submitted as evidence. They're not part of the record. The trial judge just kind of jacked them. And it says, well, if it, if it will help, we'll submit as supplemental evidence. So they supplemented the evidence by putting it as an attachment to the appellate record. So here's the stuff that should have been here but wasn't because it didn't exist. But here it is. And now the Court of Appeals is supposed to figure this out on the first instance, just now being presented with the evidence. This isn't what the Court of Appeals does. You know right away this is not going to end well. The Court of Appeals does not consider new evidence. That's not what, what they do. And we're supplementing the record, not because we made a mistake in, in not preserving something or trying to elevate something that was on the district level, but we just forgot to attach. We're not trying to perfect our appeal by 
supplementing it from stuff that's on the record. No, we're giving you stuff outside the record. Completely new stuff. Never before seen, except by the trial judge. Okay. Yeah, no, the, the Court of Appeals is going to have none of this. Given the extreme confusion surrounding the videos and documents that were properly before the court and how they came to be there, yeah, because the trial judge jacked our case, as well as the plaintiff's objections to authenticity, the motion was denied. Yeah, so we, we, we are refusing as the Court of Appeals to accept your, judge, judge, your, your joint motion. Just because you both want us to doesn't mean we're going to do it. We are not going to do it. We are not going to accept these records because they're not part of the record. And also one of you is disputing whether or not there's a, they're authentic. We are certainly not going to figure any of this out. No, we're not considering these attachments. We're just going to beat the trial court to death for not considering this dead. So we don't want them. We don't want to look at them. We don't care. We're just going to reverse until the trial judge to do his job. We don't want it. All right. Fair enough. I do the same thing as the court of appeals. I'm not going to figure this out. No way. Regarding the summary judgment procedures employed by the district court, the plaintiffs contend, among other things, the court provide insufficient notice of an opportunity to respond to the summary judgment. Yeah. Multiple versions of the body camera video exist, and the version contained on the provided the district court was not authentic. Okay. I mentioned where multiple versions exist, but apparently they do. Fine. We agree that unusual procedures employed by the district judge. That's one way to put it. Unusual procedures. That's one way to put it. Uh, otherwise put put as the district judge jacked our case. Namely requiring the 14th February CD to pr produce only to him. Require our vacating and remanding because they deprived access of access to matters on which the court granted relief. As as should surprise literally no one. Yes. The attorneys for the case can have access to the material the trial judge used as part of its decision. That is a thing that they're allowed. And that didn't happen for some reason. So, in ruling on a 12b6 motion, which is a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, the court is required to consider facts alleged in the operative complaint and written as exhibits attached to it, which, you know, they aren't. There aren't any exhibits attached to the complaint, because how could there be? The complaint is, our guy was shot in violation of law. What attachments would there be? I mean, not the video, because we don't have it yet, because we just started the lawsuit. So, there's no attachments worth considering. Yeah. If matters are beyond these are presented, the, the court is beyond has discretion to complete them. On a motion to dismiss, yes. On a motion to dismiss, yes. On a motion to dismiss, all you consider are, are the pleading. The pleading well pleaded. What does it show? You don't have to consider anything else on a motion to dismiss. But that's not where we are. On the other hand, yeah, if matters outside the pleadings are presented to and not excluded by the court, the motion must be treated as one for summary judgment. Yeah. So if other matters are presented outside that and they're not excluded, then it becomes a motion for summary judgment because suddenly we're considering evidence outside the pleading. You don't do that on a discovery on a motion to dismiss. All you do is consider the pleading. That's about it. And now we have stuff other than that. And the court says, oh, I want to consider that too. The court can do that, but you can't do it without doing a summary judgment, which comes with all the things that it comes along with. Like, for example, all the parties must be given a reasonable opportunity to present material that is pertinent to the motion. So sure, if you as the trial court want to consider things outside that stuff, no problem. You can do that. But you are now in a motion for summary judgment, which means both sides have the opportunity to present evidence and stuff. And no, you didn't do that. And what is going on? As discussed, the court's opinion applies and considered the body camera footage. But as discussed both above and below, these types of videos were contained only on the initial disclosure CD because they couldn't possibly be attached to the pleading. How would that even happen? That wouldn't even make sense. How could they possibly be attached to the pleading? We just filed our lawsuit. How could we possibly have the body camera footage at that point? Yeah, of course it doesn't exist. The justice judge instructed to give him only at the conference. Also discussed because the CD contained many other documents, it's unclear whether the courts consider these documents as well. Or whether or not we could have any discussion about it or argument or whatever, yeah. The key difference in this situation versus the prior situations that have existed in prior cases is the courts intercepting the CD at the scheduling conference. At the outset, we note the transcript of this conference is incomplete because the court engaged repeatedly and for multiple minutes in off-the-record commentary. 
that's also super, super encouraging when there are gaps in the record because the court went off the record. That's also super encouraging. So there's there's this conference that's being held and the court is having apparently multiple minute gaps off the record. No, that's not really like a thing that normally exists. You can go off the record for usually brief periods of time, but we're having huge discussions off the record. No, that's not really not really super encouraging to the Court of Appeals. There's a reason there's supposed to be a record. The defendants were prepared at that scheduling conference to produce the plaintiffs the CD had asked and contain their initial disclosure, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, right? We have a scheduling conference. We're trying to figure out when certain things are going to happen. We know we're going to see you in person anyway. So we could have it. We could mail it to you. We could have it couriered over to you. Why not just hand it to you in person? Now, we could have done it like, now we could have done this in the hallway or the atrium or whatever, but maybe we didn't have an opportunity. Maybe the first time we saw each other was when we both walked in the room for a scheduling conference and said, as it happens, I just happen to have something for you. Open my briefcase. Here's my discovery. And the judge says, yoink. Okay, that, that wasn't supposed to happen. The district judge asked the defendants where the plaintiff's counsel had gotten a copy of the film from the incident. They were supposed to. You just yanked my copy. The defendant's counsel responded affirmatively stating the plaintiff's version had not yet come from the plaintiff's, but from an open records request. The parties did not discuss exchanging all the documents in its possession because of the pending motion, and defendants had a CD on the material ready to go. So they were able to obtain the video from open records request outside discovery. Okay, that's good news. But we haven't obtained it through discovery, through formal disclosure. So yes, we have seen the video, but we haven't seen all the other stuff. Okay. The district court did not confirm with the plaintiff's counsel the plaintiff had access to the body camera video or confirm any version to which he had access was the same version in the CD. Because there may might, might be more than one version of this thing. Who has what exactly? These are, these are one of the reasons we do things in a formal process to make these things clear. It instead instructed the defense to hand the CD up to the court. What? Defendant's counsel advised the court the CD contained not only body camera footage, but also everything from the investigation, other files in the investigation, and internal affairs. At oral argument before our court, and plaintiffs stated they understood the CD to contain hundreds of documents. There were other things we were, put, we were trying to give them, too. Other than just, we, we were, we were going to give them the video, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff. As stated, the documents and videos on the CD the district judge took at the 14th of Feb February scheduling conference were to be provided to the plaintiff as defendants required under the Rule 26A1 initial disclosures. In that regard, where the defendant and videos are understood to be documents and electronically stored information or the CD containing them is to be considered a tangible thing, the defendants were ready to produce copies of the documents, electronically stored information, or other tangible things they had in their possession, custody, or control, and might use to support their claims or defenses that they would not be used solely for impeachment. Just by way of what the word impeachment here means in this context, because it means something different than in the presidential present. just by way of brief description, impeachment here means something different than it would mean as it relates to the president. So we heard the word impeachment used a lot relating to the president. In that context, the word impeachment is a political process, a process of removing somebody. Here, when the court is using the word impeachment, it's using it in a legal term. The word impeachment here means to undermine someone's credibility. So if you have someone on the stand, for example, and you want to present something, you can present it in one of two ways. You can present it either as evidence or as impeachment. So information that might not be available for evidence because it's being excluded by hearsay or other reasons can be used for credibility. So if the person on the stand is lying, you can present information that shows them to be lying, even if that information would otherwise be non-presented, because technically you're not using it as evidence. You're using it for impeachment. You're using it to attack credibility. And so that's what they're talking about here that this information is not being used solely for the purpose of impeachment. It actually has material weight, which it does. First of all, we're not far enough along to really impeach anybody. We're at initial disclosures. So there's no one on the stand to impeach. There's no one's credibility yet to be attacked. So talking about impeachment at this stage of the proceeding doesn't even make sense. And even if it did, there's a lot of things here that are substantive in terms of reports and records that are going to be helpful to developing the case in a material way not just merely for the purpose of addressing credibility issues. In this instance, as stated, the court itself, at the initial scheduling conference, asked Planff what was shown on the video regarding their allegations of, among other, among other things, 
post-shooting pain and suffering. Defendant described the video to counter assertions plaintiffs had made based on whatever video they had seen about how long it took EMS personnel to arrive at the scene. Because the abnormal procedure was manifestly any use of discovery materials in connection with a motion, the videos were part of that motion and should have been filed. So they should have been part of the record. And they're not. And there should have been more opportunity for more stuff beyond this. So the record on appeal does not show the videos containing on the CD took at the scheduling conference were ever electronically filed or not electronically filed by delivering them to the court. Because of course they weren't because we're well outside the normal procedure. The plaintiffs are entitled to these rules protection. Yes, they are. That's what we call due process. It's in the Constitution. Read about it sometime. At its core, the protection is simply fundamental fairness that due process requires. There being two, among other things, to access the same video on which the court apparently relied in granting its motion for a scheduling conference. Along that line, filing as contemplated by the rules obviously has meaningful consequences. It enters the file items into the record, establishing exactly what items are at issue and may be considered by the court. It makes clear what was being considered. What did this court look at? We have no idea what the court looked at because it's not on the record. It's not here. We have no idea what they watched. And it allows other parties to also review them. That would have been helpful too. The failure to follow this rule leads to these issues, including confusion, the clout, the appeal. This is very, this is very friendly language from the Court of Appeals. This is extremely super friendly language from the Court of Appeals. Because were it up to me, I would not be writing this way. I would not be writing things like, this has somewhat muddled the record and somewhat clouded the issues on appeal. This is, this is a little bit weird. Something's a little bit suspicious here. This is not my initial impulse on how to write this. The way I want to write this is, the trial court is insane and loco and cocoa puffs. That's the kind of thing I want to write. Now, I'd tone it down a little bit for the decision, but this is a very charitable, friendly version from the Court of Appeals, trying to give this guy an out. So, noted. Although the CD taken by the district judge at the scheduling conference may have contained the same video and documents later produced, the record does not establish this because they weren't filed. We have no idea. We have no idea what documents are on their video. No clue. Okay, that's that's good. The plaintiffs contest, moreover, the authenticity of the videos produced to the court because, as they state in oral argument, they understand them to have different timestamps and be edited differently from the versions they possess. So we actually have a factual basis to suggest there might have been some manipulation of the video because we did request it as part of an open records request. So we got that version, and we also have the version that was produced by the other side, and there might have been some issues and discrepancies and differences in edit and differences in timestamps, which seems potentially a little bit weird. So there's some issues here where there might be some small things, how material those things are, who knows, but we still have no idea which one the trial court watched. So that's kind of a problem. On remand, because we're going to give you another chance to get this right, the trial court is required is to require the remaining defendants to make the initial disclosure to plaintiffs and permit them to amend their complaint based on the disclosures. They have a right to amend, too. They made an initial complaint. There's some initial disclosures. They have a right to amend. They didn't get that chance or analyze it or make any arguments. So maybe you should let the other side try to do that. That'd be good. For the foregoing reasons, the judgment of the district court is affirmed in part and vacated in part, and this action is remanded for further proceedings consistent with the opinion. So that is our end of the current coverage of the case of John Allen versus the city of Houston. In this case, John Allen was shot and killed by the police. Whether it was a good shooting or not, whether it's qualified immunity or not, we don't know. We also have absolutely no clue what evidence the trial court considered because none of it's on the record. That's bad. And also the trial court jacked the discovery from the plaintiff for no particular reason. And they didn't have it. And then converted things into a motion for summary judgment. And everyone's really confused. The Court of Appeals has sent this back to the trial judge with instructions to try again and let them actually amend their pleadings and so forth and so on. So as to the ultimate issues as to liability and all the rest of it, who knows? But this one was pretty bizarre for its procedure. Trial judges are not supposed to completely just jack 
proceedings on a whim. And that's the end of the coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel, and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.